any day. And I'll keep holding on. Praise the Lord, we are now at the foot of our study. Uh, so our program where we will now be going forward with our study. Just to remind our wonderful Radio Kush Kabri listeners and our Apostolic Church of God, uh, Apostolic Church of God, Sunday Brethren, please can you hold all calls at this point in, in time now until the end of the study, where once we finish our study tonight, we will reopen the phone lines for you to call in once again. So if you could just hold all calls at this point in time now. I'll introduce our pastor and teacher for this evening. It's Pastor Ronald Blake. Good evening. Good evening, praise the Lord. I am glad to be back here again this Monday evening, the 10th of September, 2012. I'm certainly glad that God has spared my life and your life, Brother Hill, Amen. that we can be here in His presence to do what He will want us to do. Yes. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Today, we're going to be talking about conversion. In other words, being saved from sin. What conversion actually means and how a person or how an individual life should actually change as a result of conversion uh, and to, to actually look into that I'm going to actually take you through some scriptures in a systematic way and of course as we go through these scriptures um, we will discuss, I, I will go into discussion to actually look into these scriptures deeper, more deeply and what they actually mean to us today praise the name of the Lord bless the name of the Lord so we're up to lesson 8 in our studies and we're going to go through it uh, as we normally do so please stay with us all scripture references are taken from the King James version of the Bible so as I said all scripture references are taken from the King James version of the Bible um, and so that's what we actually hold to praise the name of the Lord praise the Lord lesson number 8 as Pastor Ronald said, and the title is Conversion. Question number one. How did Jesus emphasize the importance of conversion? Now, just before I, I actually answer that question, we need to actually define define what conversion actually means. Um, and I want to de define it for you for the moment. Conversion actually basically means to, to, try, to be transformed from one thing into something else. It means to have a makeover. You know, many times you get these individuals who maybe go on a TV show and they go on, they just have a makeover and it's like before and after. A conversion means a change. A change normally for the better and not for the worse. So the question that our beloved brother here has asked is, how did Jesus emphasize now notice the word emphasize, in other words, put forward with, with a conviction the importance of conversion. Now to answer that, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. So Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. And quote, it reads, And said, this is Jesus speaking now, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now I want to break that down, dissect that for you, that, that verse to you very quickly. The word verily actually means truly, Greek word for truly. I say unto you, except ye be converted, or converted means changed for the better, and become as little children, in other words, not always thinking evil, not always having he evil in the heart and in the mind, not always having evil and wicked intentions. Yes, that's why I said, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, where Jesus actually makes reference to the kingdom of heaven is because, and why he makes reference to the kingdom of heaven is because there is a kingdom of heaven. And except we be converted, and except people are converted, there is no way, and become as little children, in other, in other words, without deceit, without defilement, with, with a pure heart. Um, Jesus said, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, my friends, Jesus Christ does not want anything that offends or, or defiles in his kingdom. If you could move on to number two, please. Thank you. Question number two. What expression did Paul use 
with reference to this experience. So for, for that I'm going to actually ask you to turn with me, turn with me, turn to your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15 and it reads now Romans is, Corinthians is after Romans now it reads and said verily I say unto you I do apologize I, I got, I've gone back to Matthew hold on 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 this is live we're bringing it straight live to you undiluted or uncut unedited straight from the studio in London here we go Let's try that again. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So here the question was, what expression did Paul use with reference to this experience as the experience of conversion? So Paul is saying, even though you've had many, many people, many, many people, telling you about the Lord Jesus Christ and instructing you in the things of God. He said, even though you've had so many instructors, yet you only have one father. You don't have many fathers. You only have one father of your faith. One head of your faith. You have one leader. You have one person who, who guides. And the person is, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So he's saying that we are led to the Lord Jesus Christ who is our father, who is the head of our faith, through the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. So in other words, Paul is saying in order for a person to be converted, they need to be taught the gospel and led to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, unfortunately, many ministries are actually basing their teachings and their operations on one or two people and say, okay, you entered into such and such ministries or this and that ministries. No. Paul is saying we've got and people need to be led directly to the Lord Jesus Christ using the word of God and not men's words. Understand. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Question number three, thank you. What other writer uses the same term to this experience? Okay, now that is and I'll, I'm sure that I'm gonna actually take you through to first Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 yes that's first peter chapter 1 and verse 3 and also first peter chapter 1 and 23 so first peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 23 reading first peter chapter 1 and verse 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead and verse 23 of the same chapter being born again being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever so here uh, the question was what other writer uses the same term to this experience and the writer is Peter because what he is saying here is that we are converted through the Lord Jesus Christ through the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that is how we are converted that is how we are changed because when Jesus Christ actually died a new covenant was made between God Almighty and us here on earth meaning that if we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and accept that he has paid the price for our sins if we believe on him we will be saved from the destruction to come and verse 23 being born again not of incorrupt not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever now I want to point out an important factor here did you actually know that the word is a seed when it's saying here being born not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever the word of God is a seed also Secularist, secularist words are also a seed. Fictional words are also a seed. Whatever you hear is a seed and has the potential to plant something within you. But those seeds are corruptible seeds. But the word of God is an incorruptible seed. And when the word of God is actually planted in you, it brings out good works. It brings out good fruit in you. It gives you. It brings about the born again experience in your life, which is 
profitable. And then you become born of the word. By the way, the word of God is Jesus Christ himself in spirit. So I hate, that's why it's so important to be born of the word. Because when you're born of the word, you're also born of the spirit. You're also born of the Lord Jesus Christ. So do remember what you listen to and what you hear can either give you, give you eternal life, give you a new life, can actually change you, can actually bring about conversion, or it can actually destroy you. You know, the, the, the scripture says, um, corrupt communi communication, bad evil communication corrupts good manners. So what we listen to is what we become. Because whatever you listen to has the potential of planting and seeding you and corrupting you. And I want to tell you something, parents. Many of you parents there listening, are the, listening to my voice here, you've done every single thing you could possibly do to keep your children on the straight and narrow. You've bent backwards for them. You've given them all you could possibly give them. You've sat them down on your knees, babes, and talked to them, and told them all what they need to know so they can actually become successful and do well and, and walk with the Lord and walk uprightly. But you see, while they're at school, while they're outside of the family home, while they're with friends, seed is actually being planted in them. And that is a thorn, that is the enemy. Satan plants thorns amongst the true plant or among the true word of God. And then we say, well, what's happened to my little Freddy or my little Paul or my little so-and-so? I'll tell you what's happened. They've been corrupted through various seeds that have been planted in them. Many times at schools, schools are now extremely secular and extremely ungodly. And a lot of the seeds they are planting in our children is not for their better but for their destruction milk. and that's why it's so important to encourage your children to feed on the word of God and get them to understand that the word of God has the power to save and that the word of God is truth that's why Jesus said thy word O oh God is true they need the word in them continue on please beautiful, beautiful. question number four how does James say this experience is brought about? Now, we're talking about the, the born-again experience. We're talking about the experience of conversion. Now, James was Jesus Christ's half-brother. Why do I say half-brother? Because he was born of Mary and Joseph, James. But, um, but James was not born as per se as by the Holy Ghost, physical birth. Because Jesus' birth was in this wise. The Holy Ghost came upon Mary and she conceived and bare a child. The Father was the Holy Spirit and Mary was the mother. Yes. So he was in, in his essence Jesus Christ's half brother. James was also one of the bishops of the early churches. Um, well theory tells us, theoretical studies tell us that James was also a bishop in one of these churches in, in Asia Minor. Um, in, in Turkey. So he also became bishop of the church. So what did James have to say about um, being born again or being converted? Now for that I'd like you to turn to James chapter 1 and verse 18. James chapter 1 and verse 18. You've got Philemon, you've got Hebrews and then you've got James. Um, and quote, it quotes saying, Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth. Understand that you are begotten, you are converted, you are saved through the Bible. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus said, the flesh profiteth little, is the spirit that quickeneth. Now, when Jesus actually said, the flesh profiteth little, it's the spirit that quickeneth, he was talking about himself. He is the spirit that quickens. Jesus also said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. People are converted through an experience with God, through the word of God. Because God's word is alive. So of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his, of his creatures. So if you're working on someone, you want someone to be converted, go around as regular as you can, give them the word of God. Feed them the true milk and before long they'll be in the arms of Jesus. Many Christians, where many Christians, gospel Christians, are falling short is that they're not giving the people the word of God. Give the people the word of God and the word of God will lead them to God. Because Jesus is the word. He, St. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was what? God. The same it was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life 
and the life was the light of men. Now I want to tell you something. Jesus is in the Bible. Jesus is in the Word. And when people feast on the Word of God, they become like Him. They become born of the Word or born of the Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. Go ahead. Thank you. Question number five. How does John refer to one that is begotten of God? With that, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 1 and verse 18. Verses 1 and 18. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and verses 18. Now, if you are starting from the back of the Bible, if you wanted to find that book, Revelation is the final chapter in the Bible, the very last book of your Bible. You count back two books and then it brings you to John. You go to 1 John um, chapter 5, verses 1 and verses 18. And it reads, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And verse 18, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Here we are. How does John refer to one? that is begotten of God. Yeah, and here we go. He said, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So we, so you can tell when someone's born of God by the life that they lead, by the fruit. They will love the children of God. They will love the people of God. They'll have a love for people. There's a difference between an unbeliever and a believer. A believer loves the things of God. And an unbeliever hates the things of God. An unbeliever doesn't care about the things of God. An unbeliever cares about himself, me, myself and I. Which is satanic, which is what caused Satan to fall. Yes. Him, himself and himself. Yes. Yeah? But a believer loves people. Has a genuine love and care for people. Secondly, they also love God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength. And thirdly, they also keep the commandments of God. God's people are also commanded keepers. Here it is in the New Testament, in the book of 1 John chapter 5, verses 1. States, states clearly, sorry, verse, verse 2, I, I've just read there, I do apologise. States clearly that we will actually keep his commandments. But I'd also like to reiterate verse 1. Um, and it says, verse 1 on the, in the same scripture, and read, and it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is the garden of God. So the Christian's life is wrapped up in love. Love for God, love for your fellow men. Yeah? And then again, they're also commandment keepers. They, they keep the commandments. Verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now notice, we know, notice this, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Do Christians sin? Is that yes or no? So I couldn't hear you. I do apologize. I couldn't hear you. Though, at all. Yeah, because, I, because we, we live in the flesh, we are human beings, we, we make mistakes. Right? But, but what the Lord is looking at is that we love him, we want to do better. We want to serve him. We don't want to sin. It means that the scripture actually, the, 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 the meaning for this scripture here means that a Christian will not deliberately go out and sin. That's what it means. And also keep on sinning presumptuously. And it says, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. In other words, he that is begotten of God, you've got to work at keeping yourself. In other words, when you, there's alcohol placed in front of you, or cigarettes, or these evil things, you say no. You've got to learn how to be strong and say no. Yes. Yeah? Where somebody tries to cause you to sin, you've got to learn how to say no. Right? So you've got to work at keeping yourself from sin. When you feel to take revenge on somebody, you've got to learn to say no. Learn to keep yourself. And, it says, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Meaning that God Almighty will protect you from Satan and his hordes. The wicked one also means witches, wizards, all of those who are on Satan's side cannot touch you once you're in God. You know, I sometimes get quite per perturbed with Christians who say they are Christians, who profess they are born again, but are afraid of witches. How can you say you're a Christian, but yet you're afraid of a witch? 
how can it be? It's impossible. Because you see, the riches of wisdom, you know, we have a power that no one can stand against. No one. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl. We have the name of Jesus. Why do you think which everybody, why do you think they try to ban the name of Jesus being called in public places? Why are they banning and say, you, know, you can call all other religious names, but don't call the name of Jesus. When the name of Jesus is called, people get offended. It's because there is power in that name. There is power. And the witches can't touch it. The wicked one, John makes it quite clear here, that the wicked one touches him not. That the wicked one will not touch you once you're living for God, once you're covered with the blood of Jesus. Once you're, living, once you're calling on the name of Jesus, Satan cannot overthrow you. It's impossible. Satan cannot step past and go over the blood of Jesus. It's impossible. He cannot do it. And a witch's witchcraft cannot work on people of God, on God's people. Cannot work. Unless there's an opening in the life for them to work, the witches to work through. Yeah. And that's why I said I get so annoyed with Christians who are afraid of witches and wizards. You know, when we were down in India, we went to a, a piece of land. Now, I was talking to a lovely Punjabi lady today. She's not a Christian, but I'm working on her. Went down to her house, prayed with her and so forth today. And I said, you know, there's a lot of voodoo in India. She said, yes, you're right. She said, it's so much that it's more in Africa. It's more than in Africa. It's more than in the Caribbean. The voodoo is really strong. And I said, you know, we went down to a place which only witches live down there. Told the fact that we're witches. There's no one like non-witches living there. So that means here in India, it's all witches. And we went down there and we held a prayer service there. Now, before we went, no pastors would go down there. Nobody, no missionary, nobody would go down there. In fact, not even strangers would come down there. And the land was barren and dry because all witches lived down there. There's a congregate in that area. And we went down there and held service down there. We went there at night. We held it down there at night. And we had to walk off the road through barren land to get to the patch of there, the area where the witches all live and congregate. And we held service and we came off and everybody came out all right. And after that, the pastor that we were going around with, he had so many calls from other ministries asking him to come and speak because, because it was, they had never heard or seen anything like this where a group of Christians would go directly into witches' territory and hold, hold service. And remember, witches can destroy, can kill people that are not protected by the blood of Jesus. But Christians, what I'm saying is, need to be bold and stand on the authority of God. And what I would say to you Christians out there, don't be afraid to call the name of Jesus. If, for example, you're working in an education industry, for a local authority, for, for the NHS, for health service, police, fire authority, home, or any, home office, or anything like that, and you're banned from speaking about Jesus, call Jesus under your breath. You must do it. Because that will destroy the powers of darkness and destroy Satan's works and operations in that place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Question number six. What happens to one's sins when genuine conversion takes place? Acts chapter 3 verse 19. What happens to one's sins when genuine conversion takes place? Acts chapter 3 verse 9. King James Version Bible we are using here. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So the scripture is saying here that if you repent of your sins and show godly sorrow, last week we, we, we did a study on repentance, so we now know what repentance is. So the scripture says, repent ye therefore and be converted, meaning change work at doing better, change yourself, change that your sins may be blotted out so when a person actually um, repents, genuine conversion takes place their sins are wiped out all the sins of their past is blotted out if you were a murderer before you came to Christ you know Jesus Christ no longer remembers that murder yes. if you were a thief and you came to Christ Jesus Christ forgets that you were a thief, doesn't remember it anymore you know, the Bible says that he cast all sins into the sea of forgetfulness, never to re be remembered anymore. You see, once we become to the, come to the Lord, God doesn't remember our past. He keeps no record of our past. I can prove that to you biblically as well, very easily. If you turn your Bibles, don't do it now, but if you, in your spare time, if you turn, wait to turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11, you will see the names of many people who fall to terribly in the scriptures. 
but yet they're in Hebrews 11, which is the chapter, the Hall of Fame for the Bible. It talks of Samson, it talks of Japheth, who literally was a, was a son of a prostitute. It talks, and, and the same man also offered his daughter as a human sacrifice. It talks of Gideon, who was a doubter. Yeah? It talks of all these people who had failed terribly. It talks of Sarah, again, who doubted and who actually laughed when the Lord spoke to her. In, 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 in unbelief. Yeah. It talks about all this, but they are in the Hall of Fame. Because, you see, when a person's sins are forgiven by God, they are also forgotten. And I tell you one thing that Satan always does. He tries to bring back to your, your remembrance what you did in the past. The accuser of the brethren. He, is the, he tries to bring back what you've done in the past. But when Satan brings it back, Satan, listen, Satan, you're a liar. My sins are, for, are forgiven me and they are gone. They no longer exist. And God has blotted them out of his book. See, God has got a book of death and a book of life. The people in death, all their, in the book of death, all their sins and their past deeds are recorded. But those in the book of life, their sins are being blotted out, never to be remembered. So when God looks at that book, he sees nothing in there, no remembrance of our sins. And in fact, he doesn't even remember our sins. He wipes his memory clean of our sins, so as though we've never ever sinned. And then as we walk under the covering of the blood of Jesus, all our sins are paid for. They're paid in full. Paid in full. You see, you can't be a thief if somebody has paid for what you've stolen. Did you understand that? Yeah. You cannot be a thief if somebody has paid for what you have stolen. Jesus Christ's blood has paid for all of our offenses. So if you were an adulterer in the past, if you were a fornicator, if you were a womanizer, if you were a manizer, whatever you were, a witch, wizard or a thief, Jesus Christ has paid the price of your sins in full and allowing you to go free. Your sins are blotted out and your name is actually in the book of life. And when the roll is called up yonder, you will be there. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Question number seven. How is the heart and spirit of man affected at conversion? Brother, I'd like you to take you to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 31. And it says, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die O house of Israel so how is the heart and spirit of man affected at conversion well God gives you a new heart a new heart did you know that actually scientists are actually saying that m the human heart has a memory and the human heart can think that's what they're now saying the human heart actually has emotions I know the Bible has spoke about the heart from out of the abundance of that, the, the, heart, the yeah. heart, the mouth the speaking. Heart, yeah. And so the heart is actually an integral part within your spirit. And it's only the last 15 years that that technology has come to life, which before people did not know. But the Bible's talked about the heart, the book of Ezekiel. Yeah, you're talking about at least, book of Ezekiel about three and a half, thousand years ago or something around around those lines and the Bible's talking about the heart there yeah so so you get a, a change of heart and you get a new spirit meaning new personality God gives you when you are converted let's continue on as we do thank you question number eight what does it mean to be carnally minded Romans 8 and verse Romans 8 verses 8 and also revert into verse 6. So Romans chapter 8 verse 8 and revert and revert into verse 6. Um, quote Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So people who are living fleshly lives, living sinful lives, they cannot please God. In fact the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. Every single day of the week, 24-7, God is angry with the wicked. You know, the many, many cities, I mean, we took have many, many cities that got, you know, I could, I could go on so many examples of, of places that are actually being destroyed because of God's anger. Every time an unrighteous man or a sinner man or a sinner woman wakes up or gets up in the morning, God is actually angry with them. 
Because my Bible tells me that the Lord is angry with the wicked every single day. He's angry with them every single day. Every breath they take, every move they take, God is angry with them. Yeah? And verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death. In other words, death means God is going to destroy you for your sins. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded, God is guaranteeing you life and is also guaranteeing you peace. To be spiritually minded. Praise the name of the Lord. Now to be spiritually minded means living the way God wants you to live. Thinking the way God wants you to think. Behaving the way God wants you to behave. That's to be spiritually minded. Continue. Thank you. Question number nine. Why is it necessary to have our minds renewed? Again, Romans 8 and this time verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So why is it necessary to have our minds renewed? And I'll tell you why. It's because the carnal mind is enmity against God. God hates the carnal mind. What's enmity? What it's an en enemy. Enemy against God. The natural mind of man is, is, is enmity against God. It's like it's an enemy to God because it goes all against his principles, against his law, against God's character. For it is, and it gives the example, the reasoning here, and it backs up what I'm saying in the second part of the verse. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither and indeed can be. So the carnal man, the carnal mind, it is, cannot be subject to the law of God. It doesn't want to subject itself to good things. The, the carnal mind wants to keep lying. The carnal mind wants to steal. The carnal mind wants to fornicate to commit adultery. The carnal mind wants to beat somebody up. The carnal mind wants to curse somebody else. It's a carnal mind. And we cannot enter into God's presence like that. Yeah, and it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So, that, so nothing can happen with our carnal mind except it be changed and that comes through conversion. Thank you. Question number 10. What must dwell in us to be spiritually minded? And again that goes back to Romans 8 verse 7. Um, what must dwell in us to be spiritually minded? We, need, we have to have the Spirit of God dwelling in us in order for us to be spiritually minded. And we've also got to have the Word of God, which is the Spirit of God dwelling in us in order to be spiritually minded. That's why the Apostle Paul said, be not conformed to be to, to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So once your mind has been renewed by the Spirit and the presence of God, you will be changed. The Spirit of God will start to come and dwell in you through His Word and you will be changed. And having our minds renewed daily by feeding you said the feeding it. Prayer is the word is your water supply. And reading the word is your food. You can't live or continue for long without either. And that is why whenever there has been persecution against the Protestant church or the church as a whole, the first thing they've gotten rid of are Bibles. They've burned Bibles, gotten rid of Bibles, prohibited the use of Bibles or the recital of, of biblical scriptures. And that's why I say it's so important that Christians learn the Bible in and out, inside out. And that is why the Jewish people, God bless their souls. By the time a Jewish boy is 13, he's got to know the first five books of the Bible inside out, be able to recite it off by heart, Orthodox Jews. So from the time that he's about three years of age, every day he's going through, and they've got to read the Torah through every, well, at least once every year. Read it through. Cover to cover, keep reading. So by the time they're 13, they've got to be able to recite from Genesis all the way down to Deuteronomy, all the books, five books, without without having to go back and reflect on the pages. And it is possible. That's why, you know, David said, I esteemed, you see, that's why David understood this, and that's why David said, King David in the Bible said, I esteem the word of God more than my necessary food. You see, physically, you are what you eat. Show me somebody with a this totally destroyed body and I will show you somebody on a bad diet show me somebody with a fit healthy dynamic body and I will show you somebody on a healthy diet show me somebody whose mind spits out whose mouth spits out obscenities 
I will show you somebody who's in a terrible spiritual dark. Show me somebody whose mouth talks out and issues out the issues of life and I'll show you somebody who's in the word of God. You are, you are what you feed on, both physically and spiritually. With the young Jewish boys, is that the bar mitzvah? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, 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 because the bar mitzvah and the girls back mitzvah at 13, but they've got to know, re re be able to recite the scriptures through, through and through. The first five books of, of the Bible, they call it Torah, but it's Torah just means book. They were able to recite the first five books of the Bible through by the time of their 13. Now, that, that does, and, and they do it, they do it, they do it. I remember yes. when I was in Israel, there was a bar mitzvah taking place and it was being done outside. And there was a little Jewish boy there, but it was quite small for his age. It was about nine, but it was 13. And, it was bar, and he was there just reciting, reciting, reciting Hebrew, the first five books of the Bible. How God must love these people. David understood it, and that's why King David said, I esteem the word of God more than my necessary food. And I tell you, we as Christians could learn something. And if only we would spend more time in the word of God. Look, when we want to learn a trade, say for example, you want to become an, uh, a tool maker or something, something secular. You go, on, you go on to an apprenticeship or you go to university or college and you'll be reading the books to your eyes that bloodshot red. And many times you'd have to be, to be doing that for three years until you become yeah. a skilled practitioner. Why don't we do the same thing with the scriptures? Because we are Christians. We are born again. Our lives belong to the Lord. And we are supposed to know the Bible in and out, cover to cover. And I think it's a big, big shame. And it actually is a disgrace when a Christian doesn't know his or her Bible. It's a disgrace. Because that always points to the question, well, how much of the Bible is that individual really reading? How much are they really committing there? How much of their time are they really committing to the word of God? It's like, for example, you can tell a slobby musician from a good musician, a slob one from a good one. A slob one just rattles out a couple of chords here and there, a couple of notes here and there, and it doesn't sound good. That's a slobby. And then you realize that person is probably putting either practicing wrong or not putting in sufficient time. It's either one of the two. Either the technique that they're using is wrong, or they've got a very bad tutor, or, or they're not putting enough time. And it's factual. Mm. Right? Or they're not committed to it. And it's the same with a Christian. You have a Christian, or, and it's the same with a tradesman. You might have a car mechanic. And you give him a car, and it come, the car comes back worse than what it went in. <laughs> and you have to take it somewhere else, and spend thousands of pounds to correct what the other mechanic done. I mean, I took my motor for an MOT today, um, the church van, and the touch on it needs this, it needs that. And I said, listen, what the MT test has put down is rubbish. I said, a mechanic, an MT test, he's been, and I just looked and laughed, and the man, the other catcher just laughed, and it was a job. You know, it's the same thing, you get bad tradesmen, and you get good tradesmen. Depends how much time you put into it, and how much you're committing to it. If you put into the word of God, you become full of the spirit. You become a powerhouse, you become dynamite, and God will use you more. You know, because whatever you put in is whatever you're going to get out. And I pray, you know, and I say it's a, it's a crying shame when a Christian doesn't know his or her Bible. That when you ask a Christian and look at you with a mouth open, eyes open, they don't know. It's a, it's a cry, literal crying shame. It's a crying shame. Because God expects us to take his word, his teaching, more important than the teaching and the secularist teaching that we're getting in the world. That is ruined our sons, ruined our daughters, ruined our children, ruined grandchildren. I'm not talking about our personal children, but ruined... You know, yes. When I say I try to mean it, I don't hold, right? Yes. yes. It's caused such, such catastrophe in society. We've got murders. We've got, what, what do we think is happening in society? Society is only a product of what the government has fed it. That society is just a product of what the government has fed it. It's yes. nothing more, nothing less. Yes. If you feed your, your, your people with good, wholesome things, you have a healthy nation. You know, that you'll be proud of. But when you feed your, your people with a whole lot of rot, verbal rot, or spiritual rot, it's going to cause a degradation, degradation in the nation and bring the nation to rot. And that's what we're seeing in so many nations around the world. I think these prime ministers you need to be ashamed of their house. Because I'm telling you that the country is the prime minister's house. It belongs to him. And they need to be ashamed. When you look and see the crime, the, 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 the amount of people in prisons, the amount of sick people, the amount of beggars on the road, homeless people, people without hope, the, the leaders of the country should be ashamed of those countries, should be ashamed because the country is their house and they're ruling the house.
You know, as you say that, it's so so true because years ago judges went by what the word of God established. And there was this particular judge about two days ago who who praised a burglar. Yeah. And said that the burglar was courageous. Yes. Yeah. To have broken into this particular person's house. Yes. Yes. Where does that come from? And that and that's what I'm saying. And that's why I've always said, and I'll, I'll reiterate this again: you cannot get good laws and good decisions from people who do not have a background in a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because how do you decipher the difference between good and evil when you have no morals yourself? When your life is not morally being controlled by good wholesome scripture. Yeah. So therefore how do you weigh between good and bad? Obviously then your own thoughts are going to come and you're going to slip up. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It's not the judge's fault. I don't blame him. I blame those above him. But he's one of the I yeah, but I, and I don't blame I, I don't blame I blame the system that these people are operating in and I've been forced to operate under, which is a very ungodly and secular system. That's what I blame. Because these people are a product of the system that they that have actually produced them. So when we go pointing our fingers at him and say it's you, you no, the finger actually comes back on ourselves. Because individuals are generally a product of the society or a product of the training that they've received or the teaching they've received. But the thing is, when people slip up, nobody wants to accept the blame. Yeah. Nobody wants to accept the blame. Yeah. I say, well, could it be us? Could it be us? What's gone wrong here? Do we try and um, victimise the individual? Anyway, let's continue on as we do. Thank you. Question number tw uh, 11. Is it necessary to have the indwelling of God's Spirit? Romans, for that I'd like to turn you to Romans 8 and verse 11. Quote, and it says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Is it necessary to have the indwelling of God's Spirit? Yes, and shall I tell you why? Um... If you want to be raised from the dead, in other words, converted from evil works to good works, not as it says, the question was, is it necessary to have the indwelling of God's Spirit? Now the fact is, here it is, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Twofold, the Spirit of Christ comes in you and makes you new into a new person quickens your mortal body so you no longer operate the fleshly man or fleshly woman you know there was a saying that used to go around this person's either mad foolish or a Christian because we walk by a different standard we live by a different standard also when the rapture comes if you don't have this spirit you're not going up the Bible says they that have my spirit these say they he are mine you, you've got to be born of the Spirit to be able to be counted in the number. God will not count you in as one of His people unless you are born of His Spirit and have His Spirit living in you. Which will also quicken you and alert you to the trumpet when it sounds. Go ahead. Question number 12. <clears throat> what happens when the Spirit of God comes into one's life? For that I'd like to turn you to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. And St. John chapter 6 verse 63. So what happens when the Spirit of God comes into one's life? Ephesians 2 verse 5, quote, Even when ye were, even when, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And St. John chapter 6 63, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. So what happens when the Spirit of God comes into one's life? Your change happens. You are changed. Amen. And notice, it didn't say when religion comes into your life. It said when the Spirit of God comes in. Because when the Spirit of God comes in, He will change you on the inside. And He will speak to you and He will teach you the things you need to know. It's a personal relationship with the Lord. Thank you. Question number 13. How does Paul describe the one who is converted? Second, how does Paul describe the one who is converted? Second Corinthians 5 verse 17. It says, quote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So when a person is converted, if he's in Christ, he is a new creature, he's changed from one metamorphosis, met metamorphism, that's what it is, metamorphosis. He changes from one uh, state. state to another state. Um, all things are passed away, what he used to be is no longer. Behold, all things are become new. It's a little bit like you have a maggot and then you get the fly. That's metamorphosis. Met met the me what, what, what do you pronounce the word? Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. That, that's what it basically is. Or caterpillar. Caterpillar into the butter or whatever, or however you have it. And so, you're, so before you're converted, you are the maggot. The maggot. Or, yeah, and then after you're converted, you're the fly. Or before you're converted, you're the caterpillar. After you're converted, you're the butterfly. Yeah. So it's metamor metamor metamorphosis. Met metamorphosis. Sorry for my list of time, but that's what basically happens. So you change. When a person is converted, you change. But you change. The significant factor is that you change unrecognizably from what you were initially. You no one ever believed that a fly actually started life as a maggot. And no one would ever believe that a butterfly actually started life not being able to fly but crawling on the road, well, road. On the, on the ground, almost resembling almost that of a worm. Yes, a worm with legs. <laughs> yes, so, so bear that in mind. You Great. change. When the spirit comes in, you change. Thank you. Continue. Very good analogy. Uh, question number 14. <clears throat> Does outward form avail anything without an inward work of grace? Does outward form avail anything without an inward work of grace? Not, well, Galatians 6 5 says, Galatians chapter 6 verse 5 says, For every man shall bear his own burden. Meaning that, um, the other form, yeah, does outward form avail anything without an inward work of grace? Meaning, does religion avail anything without an inward, inward, inward work of grace? And the answer is no. Religion does not, religion is only on the outside. It's a human being carrying a weight on their back. That's what religion is. Yeah, okay. um, but but the inward work of, of grace brings about life changing and spirit changing results. So you don't actually want to do the things that you used to do. Whereas a man that's just controlled by religion, yeah, wants to do the things that he doesn't that he knows he shouldn't do, and therefore because he wants to do them, he does them secretly on the quiet. That's the unconverted soul. Thank and you. may God have mercy upon those souls. Continue. Indeed. Question number 15. How much was Paul willing to give up for Christ? Philippians 3 verses 7, 8 and 10. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Paul. He was actually someone who was a persecutor of Christians. He was actually a blasphemer, but God forgave him his blaspheming because he did it in ignorance, thinking he was doing God good, doing God, you know, working in God's kingdom. Whereas in ignorance, he was more or less trying to break kicking against the priests. Um, now, Paul, he was actually a doctor of, of, of the law. He was a very educated man, a very educated and renowned man in his time, of the tribe of Benjamin. He would have had inheritance to a lot of money. He was of the um, Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees, which is a political, religious kind of new, uh, movement. He had a couple of sects there in the New Testament. He had Zealots, he had Pharisees, he had Sadducees, um, he, had, he had the Sanhedrin. But Paul belonged to the sect of the Pharisees, and the two leading ones were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees combined to make up the Sanhedrin, which was more or less the council that ran the country. Right? So he was that he was into he was in position. He had money, he had wealth, and everything. But when he came to Christ, he put every single bad thing down because he realized that what he had was <coughs> preventing from entering into the gates of heaven. Let's see what the scriptures tell us. Philippians three. Verses 7, 8, and 10. And here we go. Reading in, 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 in systematically, chronologically. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. The Apostle Paul remembered that you can't have too many worldly goods or too many worldly ideologies in your head and serve God and be, be, be converted and believe and live his way. So 
So what Paul had to do, he had to undo all the learning. He was actually taught by Gamaliel, yeah? He was the head, the head teacher at that time. Um, Dr. Gamaliel was the head teacher in the, in, the, in the law of the Jews. And not only in the law of the Jews, but like in the social science research, that kind of a thing. Anthropology and those type of, uh, of, of, of disciplines. Paul was trained under him and Paul was very, very, very well educated. Even when you read his writings, Paul would have spoken several languages. Even when you read his writings, you can see that he was a very educated man. And he also had very good social skills because he could get on with anyone. Yes. He could get on with anyone. And because of that, his ministry was very strong. God used him. But he realized that unless he was willing to drop off all what he had been taught in the past, put it aside, and leave his life, the past, his past life alone, that he wouldn't be able to win Christ. So in order to win Christ, and to be in Christ, and to have Christ in his life, he had to give up all what was before him. Okay? And, and verse 10 says, Philippians 3 and verse 10 says, that, and Paul did this, quote, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This also means many times as Christians we have to give up things we love for the sake of the gospel. Paul did it. But he was saying, um, you know, in order to know God and to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So Christianity also means sacrifice. Be prepared to put what you're saying into action. To live out what you say. Yeah? So Paul was, and, he, and he said he gave up so much stuff on the Lord. But then he's gone down in history of the most effective and efficient evangelist of all time. Why do I say that? Because if you look at the persecution that the first century church we're facing it, it's absolutely you wouldn't believe it it's, it's unbelievable it's, it's unbelievable yeah. the persecution they suffered they were killed they were stoned they were put in coliseums they, 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 were, they were pitched against lions that to fight against gladiators they were beheaded the, 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 the local community would also kill them if they were killed in the streets by the local community no it was not a crime to kill a christian we met a christian it was not considered a crime and leave bodies on the street or, or they were used as cannon fodder, they were literally um, based in, in animal fat and, and used, k killed and then used to light up the streets. All of that was happening. And Paul was, these people were operating under such a system and that. In them, Paul was actually executed in Rome for his faith, put to death. Like all the other 12 apostles, like all the rest of the world. Like all the other 12 apostles were killed, also killed. John, John the Divine escaped. We don't know what happened to him when he got out of, of, of Batman. Because it ends, they don't hear nothing more of him. Maybe yeah. they got him again and killed him or he died shortly after, we don't know. Yeah. But we know, records show that all the disciples were martyred and killed. Killed, martyred. Or what they, or what they had suffered that led to their death. Indirectly led to their death. Yeah. Yeah? So they went through a lot. They really, really did suffer. So, see, bring in mind that Paul was going around the Roman Empire, Asia, um, and, and so forth. And Europe, um, some of Europe, um, North Africa, the places he actually travelled and he went. The persecution of Christians were extremely high because there was paganism, the worship, worship of false gods and, and the such like. Also, Christians were also being forced to offer sacrifice unto gods, or to the gods of the pagans, forced to offer the sacrifice unto, them, unto pagan gods, forced to offer and bow unto them. So they were operating under that pressure, but yet they, they, they brought so many thousands to the Lord. In others, they were willing to, to, to practice and live out what they were saying. Let's, let's move on from here. Question number 16. What was Peter able to do after conversion? Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Peter was commanded to strengthen his brethren when he was converted. If you notice before, all those years, Peter was traveling around with Jesus, he was not saved, he was not born again. In fact, none of the disciples were, because Jesus not yet said his brother. They were just normal men, and that's why he could take his knife up, be, be praying with Jesus one minute. The next day, take his knife and cut somebody's ear off. Jesus would be like even thinking. Yeah, instant, yeah. Yeah, but, but he said, but Peter, when you are converted, 
strengthen your brother in other words, in other words feed the sheep of God feed the people of God look after the people of God when you're converted but he, was not, he would not be able to do it in his normal strength before conversion Amen. continue question number 17 by what power is this change accomplished 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 quote but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord so the power that, that God uses to change us is the Holy Spirit within our heart now the Holy Spirit is sometimes described as your conscience that nagging conscience that is don't do something or tells you turn left instead of turning right or turn right instead of turning left that guides oh. that instructor to, that also gives you that gut feeling that God uses the Holy Spirit as a mechanism within conversion praise the Lord, let's continue here. question of 18 what is the experience of everyone who thus yields to God Romans 8 verse 1 Therefore, it, th there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. When a person is, is, is converted, yeah, or when a person yields to God, there is no more condemnation. You're out of God's bad books and into his good books. In other words, your name is totally erased from the book of death and placed in the book of life. And God does not condemn you at all because you're covered by the blood. Because the blood of Jesus paid for your sins, so you're free to go. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you. Question number 19. What kind of life were the truly converted live? Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world so the truly converted person will live a life of example will live a life without reproof or should strive to live a life without reproof live soberly in other words don't just speak off the cuff think before you speak soberly think before you act righteously good work godly a life that that emits godliness that people look at you because see your difference see godliness coming through you in this present world, even though we're living in a wicked world, we 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 swim up river. We swim up river, even though we're living against the time, though we're living in a wicked world. Continue. Thank you. Question number twenty: Is sanctification a part of conversion? For that, I'd like to turn to you to turn to First Thessalonians four. Verses 3, 4, 5 and 23. Now is sanctification a part of conversion? Now I want everybody to listen to this because why I'm saying that is because the word sanctification doesn't seem to be preached anymore. There was a time when it was when people were actually encouraged to have the, the, the born again experience to be saved. Yes. Then after that to receive to, to, to have the sanctification experience where God has cleansed you from sin so you can now live a holy life without sinning sanctified you want to live holy you understand yes. you want the Holy Spirit to live in you and dwell with you you don't want the things of this world anymore and then to be filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost where the Holy Ghost comes down and begins to lead you guide, direct you, teach you, give you vision, give you dreams talk to you, instruct you give you the power to function important let's see what First Thessalonians 4 3 and 4 say about that and it says for this is the will of God even your sanctification Christians are supposed to be sanctified the doctrine of sanctification is not fiction it's a fact Do you know the doctrine of sanctification has been thrown out by many Bible colleges would you believe that yes it's been thrown out by many Bible colleges that have actually run with the doctrine or the teaching of oh once you're saved or once saved always saved no matter what you do, you're going in. That's a lie. That's a lie. Yeah. Sanctification is a part of conversion. Here it is. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Sanctification means to be cleaned up. Even your sanctification. Yeah? That ye should abstain from fornication. Fornication, I believe, not. I don't know, know personally, but 
fornication, I believe, seems to be a major sin of many. Now, fornication is also one tool that Satan uses to destroy people's Christian stand with God. Stay away, people, from fornication. Yeah. Fornication is intimate relationships outside of marriage. Adultery is intimate relationship. When you're married and you go off with someone else, that's adultery. Stay away from those things because those things defile your those things defile your spiritual man. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So that so Paul is saying, stay away from sexual immorality. Stay away from it. That's part of your sanctification. And verse 23, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5:23. Sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5:23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ so it says and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ what is the preserver of our soul the Holy Spirit, the Holy spirit. he is the preserver of our, of our soul he, he, he's deity um, he's, it's the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ because he comes out from Jesus Christ. He's the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit will keep us. But the point is we've got a part to play in our sanctification. That's what I'm saying. We do our part and God will do his. 21st and last. How is one sanctified? For that I'd like to turn you to St. John 17, verses 17 and 19. And Ephesians 5 26. So that's St. John chapter 17, verses 17 and 19, and Ephesians 5, verse 26. So St. John 7 17 17 reads, Sanctify them through thy word, thy word is true. So the word of God is the cleaner. The word of God is like a disinfectant to the spiritual man. If you want to be clean and acceptably go start, start to read your Bible seriously. And verse 18. Sorry, um, sorry, I dropped it. And verse 19. Um, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So Jesus said, I watch what I do, I watch what I say, I live up what I am, do what I am preaching, so they can have me as, a, as an example. That's why Jesus is the only person that lived on earth who has never ever sinned. Every single person that has lived on earth, even the babies, have sinned. David summed up quite nicely in, in, in Psalms 51. And he said, um, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a right spirit. Um, he also then went on to say, but behold, I was shaped in sin, and in iniquity did my mother conceive me. So David realized that even children are born sinners. And if children are born sinners, that also means that they need a saviour. And Ephesians 5.26 and then we close here that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word now we're finishing here now I know that Mooney wants to call in Mooney the phone lines are open please